Hey guys, welcome back. Today I'm going to be rebuilding the differential from a 2005 Toyota 4Runner. I'm going to start by cleaning it off so I'm not as greasy as I work on it. If you don't have your differential out yet, I'll put a link down below to a video where I pulled this one out. The first thing I do is put some match marks on the housing and the bearing cap. I use one dot on the left side and two dots on the right side. And that way we don't mix up the bearing caps when we go to reinstall them. After you have those marked, we're gonna pull the bearing caps off and the retainers off that keep the adjusting screws from turning. These have a 12 millimeter bolt and the bearing caps have a 17 millimeter headed bolt. So go ahead and take all this stuff off. And the reason I'm replacing the bearings in this one is it had a growling noise. Um, once I get it further apart, I will show you what was making the noise. But if you have gear failure, I will not cover how to set up new gears um, this is mostly just if you're reusing your old gears and putting new bearings in. To get the differential carrier out of the housing, you're going to have to loosen up one of the adjusting screws on the side. Um, I just use a spanner wrench, loosened up one, and then we can drop that out of there and get it out of the way because we need to remove the pinion next. But real quick, I'm going to show you what noise I was hearing while driving the vehicle. To take this flange off, there is a 30 millimeter nut. Just loosen that up. And then I don't pull the flange off first. I just use an air hammer to drive the pinion out the bottom. Once you have the pinion out, you can remove the pinion seal and below that seal is an oil slinger and the outer pinion bearing. The oil slinger will be reused, so make sure not to throw that away. And now we can clean up the housing to get the races out. On this particular housing, there is a deflector that is underneath the outer bearing and that is preventing us from knocking that bearing from the opposite side. And it also prevents putting a three or two jaw puller down in there unless you have one with very thin jaws. So we're gonna have to find another way to remove that. And the method I chose to use was welding a bead around the race. And this is a trick I saw someone else do. They just welded a bolt to it. So you have something easier to grab onto. So I tack welded the bolt first, and then I just welded a continuous bead around the center of the race. Make sure you don't weld the race to the housing. If you weld a bead right in the center and weld it all the way around, that would be best. The results will be better if you use a gas shielded MIG welder, a arc welder, or a flux core MIG welder. will leave a lot of splatter and slag that you have to clean up afterwards. And what this is doing is it's welding extra material to the inside of the race. And as that material cools, it's gonna shrink the race for us and the race should fall right out. So I waited a few minutes, two or three minutes is all it needs. That race cooled off. I grabbed the bolt with my pliers and pulled the race right out. So there was a few pieces of slag in there. I just knocked them out. And then now I use a big brass punch to knock out the inner bearing. Uh, you don't have to use a brass punch because we're not reusing that bearing, but this is the longest punch I have. With both races removed, I'm just gonna take this housing and throw it into my hot tank. So that's where the housing's at. And now we can pull the bearings off of the pinion and the carrier. Now I use this tool by Yukon Gear and Axle. It works very well. It has a couple of different size bearing cages that you put around the bearing and then you just tighten down the forcing screw and it will remove that pinion bearing. 
This one seemed like it was extremely tight. It took a little bit to get it going. And then I flipped the cages around because initially I didn't have a good pull on it, but I had to lift it up a little bit before I could flip the bearing cages around to the smaller setting. <clears throat> And I was lacking just a little bit of height to get that bearing all the way off. So I put a little spacer on top of the pinion, ran it down one more time. Once the bearing is off, make sure that your pinion shim is still on the pinion and not stuck to the bottom of the bearing because we're gonna reuse that with the new bearing. Now we can pull the side bearings off the differential carrier. I'm gonna use the same tool, but I'm gonna add this spacer onto the carrier grab the bearing cages or clamshells, put those on there. There's a lock ring that goes on over that. And these things will pop right off of there. This bearing press is kind of expensive. It's around six or 700 bucks, but if you're doing a lot of differential rebuilding, it is a huge time saver over using the press or a two jaw puller on everything. And I'll put some links down below of where you can buy this tool. I believe I've seen it on Amazon as well as Randy's Ring and Pinion. Um, so if I can find those links, they will be down in the description below. I'm just gonna zip off the other side and now we can install the new bearings. You wanna make sure that the part that you're pressing on is the inner race. We have to be careful here because the bearing cage for those needle bearings sticks up higher than the inner race. So you'll have to find a bearing installer that fits down on the inner race only. Tap it a few times until it's fully seated. And then I need to add another spacer before I flip this over. Otherwise I'll crush that same cage when I'm driving the other side on. Now the bearing driver I'm using is a newer tool from Snap-on. It has steel driving cups instead of the aluminum ones. I'll use the aluminum ones later when I install the races into the housing, but I like the steel ones for this. And then now we can put the inner bearing onto the pinion. And to help with this, I'm gonna use some size collars I have from a bushing installer. And they are interlockable and stackable. So I just stack a couple of them and then tap this down. And this bearing was very tight to come off and it is very tight to go back on. So I'm kind of rattling everything off my bench here. I could have taken it over to the hydraulic press, but I didn't wanna to have to move all my equipment over there. So I just tap this one on and then I bottom out on the top of the pinion and I had to add another collar. And at that point I uh, lost my momentum and the uh, bearing wouldn't install much further. So I then took the pinion and put it on top of my bench vise. So I had a more solid surface to beat on and that allowed me to drive it the rest of the way home. So this next part is going to seem a little unfair because we need to put the races back into the differential housing. I had this whole differential housing in our hot tank to clean it out. Um, I'm using my aluminum drivers on the race because I don't have a size that'll fit right on the top lip. And you'll see what I mean by unfair when I tap this in here. The heat from the hot tank slightly expanded the whole differential housing and since the bearing races are cold, they went in with one tap. And when I switch over to the outer race, it did the exact same thing. It took one tap to fully seat it. If you have trouble with these and you wanna do the exact same thing, you may go to your local engine builder or a shop that has a hot tank and see if they can run it for 20 minutes, bring your bearing races with you and install them at the shop. So now we can install the pinion back into the housing. Make sure to use a new crush sleeve. If you're reusing the old one, you just have to be careful not to tighten the pinion nut too much because you're not gonna have that extra spring pressure. So I apply a little bit of 90 weight here to the bearing and I'm just putting it above the cage so it soaks down into the bearing. Some people will pack these with grease, but I just use the ADW90. So now we can install this into the housing and then I'll stack up some spacers below the pinion and set the whole thing down on top of that spacer to hold the pinion up into the housing while I install the outer bearing. So I'm gonna lift that whole thing up, set it down onto that spacer. It's gonna support the pinion in the upright position we can install that outer bearing. I apply a little bit of ADW90 to that bearing as well. And then I'm gonna use the same drivers I used earlier to install this bearing onto that pinion. <laughs> 
tap that down until I bottomed out on the pinion, added another spacer, tapped it down a little bit further, and then I ran out of room, so I had to add another shim underneath the pinion to get that pinion fully seated into the bearing. So a few more taps and I fully seat this up against the crush sleeve, and that's all I need to do right now, and we'll get the rest tightened up later. So with that done, we can put the oil slinger on top of this bearing. Since I'm reusing the old gears, I'm going to fully assemble the pinion right now and put the pinion seal in. If you are setting up new gears, I recommend leaving the pinion seal out until you know for sure that your pinion is at the right depth. So just tap the outer edge of this seal until it sits flush with the housing. And then with the pinion supported, we're gonna reinstall the flange and I tap it into place as well. So I'm not putting as much stress on the threads by pulling it on. It's much easier on the threads if you fully seat the flange before putting the nut on. Once I get this flange seated down, I'm gonna use the old nut to do the initial torque on it. So I do this with an impact. They make a tool that holds the flange and you can tighten it by hand. As you can see there, there's a lot of slop in that. The nut is tight, but that is the crush sleeve holding space between the bearings. So it's gonna take a lot of torque to tighten that nut down and crush that crush sleeve, especially if you did put a new crush sleeve in there. So I'm just gonna keep tightening this down until I have no more up and down movement. And then we can tighten it until we set the bearing preload. Now I'm just tightening it down and I notice that I'm almost back to the original position on the nut where they had it tightened before. And I have just about run out of the uh, up and down movement. So I'm gonna start tightening it a little bit at a time and spinning it. If you're following the service manual, it's gonna tell you to tighten this down and then use a inch pound torque wrench to see how much pressure it takes to spin this. I do it by feel. It should just have a little bit of drag, not very much. So I don't use the inch pound torque wrench to feel it. Once I get it set right, I pull the nut off and put the new nut in place. And as I take that nut off, it is gonna spread out the bearings a little bit. So I'll have to uh, tighten that back down. And then once it's tightened down to where I like it, I'll use a center punch to lock it back down into that little groove on the pinion. I just put the housing upright. I just locked down onto one of the fins on it into my vise. Now we can put the bearing races on the carrier and install that carrier into the housing. And the next part of this is very important. We're gonna put the adjusting screws back into place. Now, some people will put the caps on first. I don't think that's a good idea because it's very easy to get these things cross-threaded. So I install them into the housing first. I'm just gonna clean them up a little bit and then set them down into the housing. Make sure that they turn freely before putting the cap on. These adjusting nuts have a very fine thread considering the diameter of them. So it's very easy to cross thread them. So what I do is I just set it down into the housing towards the end of the threads and then twist it in and make sure that it turns freely. The right side had a small catch but it seemed like it was up against the bearing correctly. But just to make sure I pull it back out, put it back in, because you're gonna wanna verify that these are not cross-threaded. And we can verify on the next step as well when we put the bearing caps on. So find your punch marks that we put on earlier. So as we install this onto the housing, what I do is I lift it up and I get the bolt started first. Those bolts are gonna act as a guide to get you set down onto that nut straight. This side, the bearing cap rocked around a little bit, so I was unsure if that bearing nut was in there properly. So I'm gonna do the other side and check and see how it fits. That side went right on like I expected. So on this side, 
as you can see if I lift it up it falls straight down onto the housing perfectly flat and on this other side it's kind of rocking back and forth that means that that adjusting nut is not in there straight and that the bearing cap is not falling down into the threads properly so I pull that side back apart and even though it seems like it's spinning freely, it must be a half a thread off somewhere. So I'm gonna take it back out, clean it up again, and then reinstall it. Now this may take you several times to get in place, but it's better to get it right instead of just tightening the cap down and ruining the threads. So once I have it in there straight, it seemed like it turned a lot easier and then I can put the bearing cap on and verify that it sits down flat and even. If I had tightened the cap down with that cross threaded, it would have damaged the adjusting nut and I may have had to replace it or try to repair the threads. So here I'm just going to tighten up the bolts. I use an impact. I didn't torque them to begin with but I do torque them later on. If you want to torque them now, I believe the torque spec was 62. So now we can use a spanner wrench and adjust these nuts together. And we want a little bit of preload on the bearings. I tighten the adjusting nut farther from the ring gear first, and that'll set my bearing preload. Once I feel the slop in the ring gear, then I'll adjust the other side to match it. And as we do this, we're gonna to have to loosen one side up and tighten the other. And you're gonna have to go back and forth several times. And you're just looking for a little bit of slop in that ring gear back and forth because as these gears heat up, that tolerance may shrink. And if you don't have any play in there, then they will overheat and you'll have bearing and gear failure. So I just keep going back and forth. This process can take a while, but you wanna get it right. So just a little bit of in, a little bit of out, back and forth. And I have to keep a little bit of tension in on the bearings. You want that preload so you don't have slop in the differential carrier. So as I loosen one, or if I need to move it one way, I have to loosen one side just slightly, go back to the other side and tighten it. And then once you get it close, you can put a dial indicator on there and check what your actual backlash is. I didn't look up the spec in the service manual, but most of these, if they're used gears, I set up between seven and eight. Some of the aftermarket gear manufacturers may have a different spec for this. So if instructions came with your kit and you're setting up new gears, follow the instructions listed there. So as you can see, I'm bouncing between zero and seven and a half on this dial indicator. So we are good to go. I can lock down the adjusting nuts by putting those retainers on there. And then I will go ahead and torque everything. And if you're trying to find bearings at a local parts store, you're probably gonna have a hard time. They typically are not the correct bearings. It seems very difficult to find uh, rear end bearings for a Toyota that are correct. So I have the best luck with Randy's ring and pinion, and that's where I got this set from. If you're struggling to find the correct bearings at a local parts store, you might call Randy's ring and pinion or go on their website. I believe they have an application guide if you call them and go on their website, you might check how much that bearing press is as well. Um, I'll put a link to their website down below and a link to that bearing press on Amazon and on their website. So now that everything's tightened down, I'm just going to apply a little bit of oil to the side bearings. Um, there was a little bit on there before. And in case you're wondering, this is the kit that I use to grab those sleeves out of. It is a Mueller and Coops kit for pressing out control arm bushings but the interlockable sleeves are nice for tapping stuff on like these bearings. And then here is the Snap-on and the Blue Point bearing drivers that I have. The aluminum driver is kind of a generic one. You can get these anywhere. The black one is a steel driving set from Snap-on. They also have a new aluminum driving set that I may get as well because the aluminum driving set is very nice if you're installing races. I hope you found this video helpful. I know it's not a complete service manual guide on how to rebuild this. This is just how I rebuild them. 
If it did help you, hit that thumbs up button. If you want to see more videos like this, go ahead and subscribe and click on the bell. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.